Hello and welcome. The webinar is now beginning and we will start with a word from Ben Cowan Dewar. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Nous sommes maintenant prêts à commencer le webinar. Nous allons débuter avec quelques mots de la part de Ben Cowan Dewar. Thank you, Adrian. My name is Ben Cowan Dewar. I'm the chair of the board of Destination Canada. On behalf of everyone at DC, welcome to our webinar on COVID-19 featuring the Honorable Melanie Jo Lee, Minister of Economic Development and Official Languages, yes. and Charlotte Bell, President and CEO of the Tourism Industry Association of Canada. Minister Jo Lee has also been doing a lot of listening and is a tireless champion of tourism at the cabinet table, and we're grateful to have her on the team. Charlotte, uh, can you- And before you we get started, yourself? maybe just a few words of housekeeping from Charlotte. Thank you. So uh, we're going to be taking notes throughout the session and posting them in both English and French. If you have colleagues who can join, a recording will also be available for them to access on Destination Canada's website. The webinar will be principally in English, but we will take notes tout au long du processus and we will publish them in English and in French. If you have any colleagues who have not been able to join us, Un enregistrement sera également disponible sur le site internet de Destination Canada. Ben? Thank you, Charlotte. Before we hear from the minister, I will give a quick update on Destination Canada's plans, and then we'll hear from Charlotte again from TIAC. As I mentioned on our last webinar, Destination Canada is doing a lot of listening these days. We are consulting with industry and partners to make sure that our next steps take into account the terrible reality this industry is facing. I am also proud to see how hard the staff at DC are working to understand what you are facing right now. Because our partner meetings, planning sessions, and town halls have moved online, more of our staff are able to listen in and hear directly from industry. To recap what we're hearing, number one, solvency is still an issue for most of our sector. Two, for many of you, survival depends on how quickly we can hit the ground running when the lockdowns are lifted. And three, that there is buy-in for starting with local travel. For over 50% of our industry at risk of closing, and most of our destination marketing organization partners seen their budgets decimated, Destination Canada's recovery strategy must be commercially relevant. We have been working with partners on a domestic travel program that will be the foundation of our strategy. Two of DC's greatest strengths, aligning with Team Canada and our research program, will be central to our approach. We will be calling it a domestic program rather than a campaign because we're totally reimagining the way we are working with partners. It needs to make sense in the face of the specific challenges you are facing. Our research program will help us get the timing and tone right. For our domestic program, we're not only looking into signals of when Canadians are willing to travel again, but we're also studying the willingness of communities to host visitors again. I can appreciate why people will be apprehensive about welcoming visitors, but with the right precautions, we can do it. Local businesses are so important to our communities and they need to be supported. With a solid understanding of community sentiment, we can leverage pride of place and an understanding of the value of tourism into demand. Finally, our first report for business events is now live on our website. The impact of restrictions on large gatherings on the business event sector is significant. We've seen a loss of 636 million in the first quarter alone. This report also provides analysis on sentiment towards business events and other information on travel restrictions. I'm now pleased to pass the mic back over to Charlotte. 
Thank you, Ben. Thank you and welcome to our fifth webinar with Destination Canada. Bienvenue à tous nos collègues aujourd'hui pour ce qui est notre cinquième webinaire avec Destination Canada. Today, I'm delighted to join the Honorable Melanie Jani as well as Destination Canada's Chair Ben Callendor for another session together. Je suis très heureuse de participer encore une fois avec notre ministre qui se joint à nous aujourd'hui, ainsi que Ben Callendor, président du Conseil d'administration de Destination Canada. For more than two months since this crisis began, we've worked closely with our colleagues at Destination Canada. We've been in constant contact with the minister herself, her team, top officials at ISAD, the finance minister's office, officials from the Minister for Small Business, as well as countless MPs from all political stripes. I've also appeared before the Parliamentary Finance Committee appealing to government to support this important industry as one of Canada's top economic drivers and one of the hardest hit sectors. Our advocacy work continues daily. Our message is clear. Canada cannot afford to lose the tourism industry. Pre-COVID, tourism was Canada's fifth largest sector, responsible for 10% of Canadian jobs and more than $100 billion in economic activity. And despite the benefit of government supports already in place, all of which we advocated for, we know that many of you still don't qualify for a number of these programs, and in some cases, none of them. The reality is programs were designed to reach the broadest number of Canadians and businesses and not specifically designed to support those who had been the hardest hit. Last Friday, StatsCan released its employment figures showing that since the COVID shutdown, 881,000 tourism jobs have been lost, representing 43.3% of the industry pre-COVID. McKinsey Group Research also estimates that if closures continue to September, even with a quick rebound, on average, businesses are going to lose nearly 60% of their revenues and some, of course, much higher than that. Given the government's acknowledgement of the sector's importance through the new tourism growth strategy and the inclusion of tourism as, as the seventh economic strategy table, government and industry must work together to save and sustain Canada's travel economy. And we thank the minister particularly for her support for the industry throughout this ordeal. Over the past months, we've conducted a number of industry surveys in order to provide real-time impacts to government officials to help inform decisions. This includes our survey with Destination Canada and McKinsey Group, and you're going to find the results in our daily communications today. We've also just completed more work looking into the severe impact of COVID on destination marketing organizations across the country, as well as an additional survey assessing the BCAP program accessibility issues, which reveals <clears throat> the hurdles faced by the tourism industry, including hotels. We're compiling those results and we'll share those with government officials as part of our ongoing efforts to address gaps with existing support programs. In recent weeks and days, new measures have been announced for which we await more details and we'll probably hear more about those uh, through the minister today. I know that small businesses, including seasonal and indigenous tourism businesses, have been particularly hard hit and are having a difficult time accessing some of the support programs. Recently, $675 million has been committed through the six regional development agencies to support regional economies, businesses, and organizations in regions across Canada. And this includes tourism businesses, and we understand this program will be rolling out shortly. So we encourage small businesses to register as soon as possible to access this program. And we've included details again in today's TIAC daily communications. We're also focused on recovery measures and have been working with a committee of industry leaders to develop recommendations to help the industry come out of this crisis in a coordinated manner with government support through a well thought out recovery package. We know the provinces have begun to ease on distancing measures while at the same time imposing very strict rules for small 
uh, for small and large gatherings. As you know, measures vary from province to province. Our message to government has been and continues to be that we need a national coordinated approach that includes consultation with industry in order to restart the economy in a responsible manner that will preserve jobs and businesses. On that front, we've already reached out to our provincial counterpart to work together on solutions that make sense for the industry. In closing, I want to thank each of you who take the time to reach out to us and share your challenges and concerns. We're continuing our work on, behalf, on your behalf on a daily basis, and we want to hear from you. Our surveys provide important data that needs to be shared with decision makers. So please stay informed through our various communication channels and do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thanks again to everyone for your continued collaboration. Thank you, Minister, for being here. It's much appreciated. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to the Minister. À vous la parole, Madame la Ministre. Merci, Charlotte. Ça me fait plaisir d'avoir euh, l'occasion de pouvoir t'entendre et euh, éventuellement te parler et te voir. Uh, thank you, Ben, for hosting this. Also, thank you for your leadership within uh, DC, Destination Canada. I know that my colleague, Kate Young, is also on this call. Thank you, Kate, for being with us. She's uh, my parliamentary secretary for uh, FedDev, which is the regional development agency uh, in Southern Ontario. So uh, folks, thank you for being here and uh, let's have this conversation. So I know that the tourism sector has been hard hit. I hear you, I've heard countless of your stories and let's work together to make sure that we defend the realities of workers in the tourism sector, but also of business owners. Um, et donc, ça me fait plaisir aujourd'hui d'entendre votre point de vue. J'ai eu l'occasion d'avoir plusieurs conf conversations avec vous, que ce soit euh, euh, en Acadie, que ce soit au Québec, dans les régions du Québec comme à Montréal ou encore un petit peu partout en Ontario ou dans l'Ouest. Euh, et euh, en tant qu'allié du secteur touristique, ça me fait toujours plaisir de défendre votre point de vue et, et de nous assurer d'avoir une réponse qui est en lien avec vos propres réalités. Um, so let's go through what is the reading and the priorities of the federal government, and then we'll go into more of the specifics. And I'm convinced that Charlotte and, Be uh, and Ben will ask me rel very relevant questions. And please feel free, of course, to use the chat room uh, as you may have questions or details that you would like me to provide. Um, so. There are three priorities for the federal government. The first one is obviously making sure that we keep Canadians healthy and that we can make sure that we protect their, their health, their lives and their security. And in order to do that, what we've done is to make sure that people uh, would have access to a very strong social safety net. Uh, and that's why in the context of, at the beginning of the pandemic, we created the new CRB in French, it would be la PCU, uh, and it's the $2,000 per month, the $2,000 par mois. So this, uh, this initiative is to support people uh, in all sectors, but also including seasonal sectors and in particular the tourism sector. And as Charlotte mentioned, a lot of people that have lost their jobs are in the tourism sector and they usually wouldn't have access to uh, the EI because of the fact maybe they're they're self-employed or maybe they didn't have enough hours under the EI system, but because of this new program, they're able to have access to, to at least money to pay the rent or pay the mortgage uh, and put food on the table. And also what we've done is we've increased funding through the Canada Child Benefit, so $300 more per child uh, uh, in the uh, per, per child uh, and also we've increased GST payments uh, to make sure that people can can uh, have access also to different types of funding. So I know many of you out there uh, 
are either have friends or family or workers that are benefiting from the, these aids, maybe you also are benefiting from it. And so we wanted to have a people's first approach. Uh, and then we went into our third priority, which was the economic, uh, the economic package. And so uh, we, we went from a people first approach because we wanted to make sure that people were, were not uh, confronted with a very difficult question as to whether they would have to follow the public health authorities advice or basically uh, you know go against these uh, these uh, these advice and 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 uh, and basically be anxious about making sure that they put food on the table can you hear me hello yes uh, yes we can hear you good okay yes. Thank you. Uh, perfect. So the third one was our economic package. And the idea of the economic package is not only yes, to be broad and to have uh, an approach where it, we can address some of your very, very uh, dire issues, but also to be specific for the tourism sector. So at the beginning, uh, the reading of the federal government in general was, okay, there will be a downturn, maybe revenues won't be there for one or two months, but eventually demand will be back uh, and it will be back in time for many of, of, of the tourism uh, sector realities. And therefore we need to provide liquidity. Uh, but more and more what we, what we really discovered is that while this pandemic was, was really, really, hurting us, well, an economic crisis was happening. And so we moved from having an approach where we would be supporting only liquidities to an approach where we would be going to businesses fixed cost issues and turn into much more of a subsidy approach. So uh, we have now the wage subsidy. The wage subsidy is for the months of March, April, May, but also June now. Uh, and should we go ahead uh, as we'll see how things evolve, but options are on the table. Uh, also, we're, we came up with the CBA account, the $40,000 loan, which includes a $10,000 subsidy if reimbursed within two years. Um, and also we came up with the rent relief uh, that we're partnering with provinces. And I, I think uh, I'll get questions about that. We came up with 300, uh, more than $300 million for indigenous businesses also, and a uh, billion dollar for uh, the regional development agencies, which I'm in charge of. And uh, I'll have uh, the chance to address more of the issues uh, that are linked to, well, the opportunities, let's say, uh, that are linked to the regional development agencies and how the tourism sector can really be supported through that new funding. So these are the programs that are in place. Uh, and let's work together to see how we can make sure that the tourism gets its share, share you know, share, fair share of uh, this funding. And uh, let's make sure that we can answer different, different questions that you may have. So thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. I know many of you are here. Uh, and uh, I know that you are here from different parts of the country uh, and that you may be in different types of positions, may be in charge of a the DMO, the direct marketing organizations, or uh, a tourism operator. So thank you for taking the time and I'll address, I'm convinced, many of your concerns. Donc, merci d'être là et de prendre le temps. Minister Jolie, thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. I'm Dave Robinson. I'm the interim CEO of Destination Canada. We have received many questions ahead of this webinar, and we won't unfortunately have time to answer them all, but, although we did detect some major themes and we're going to address those now with the minister. I'd like to assure everyone who has written into us that we've shared every question in full as you've written it with the department and with the minister's office. Um, Charlotte? Thank you, merci. Uh, nous avons reçu de nombreuses questions avant ce webinar. Nous n'avons pas le temps de répondre à toutes vos questions, mais nous avons remarqué quelques thèmes majeurs que nous allons aborder maintenant avec la ministre. Je tiens également à assurer à tous ceux qui ont écrit que nous avons transmis toutes les questions telles qu'écrites à notre ministère et au cabinet de la ministre. 
Dave? Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, Minister, um, uh, in the questions that we received, one of the themes uh, that we um, uh, detected was that uh, many tourism businesses are not eligible for federal relief programs or the programs won't serve their needs the way they're structured. So um, I'm going to ask for your comments uh, first um, about the Canada Emergency Business Account. Specific issues raised in the questions we saw included many seasonal businesses simply don't qualify for SEBA. Um, some uh, uh, tourism businesses are sole proprietors who hire contractors and can't perform, uh, produce a T4 summary and therefore don't qualify. And we also got some suggestions for um, improvements from industry, uh, including uh, would it not be possible to demonstrate viability based on your last five years worth of tax returns? So I wonder, Minister, if you can share with us your thoughts on, the, on that subject. Yeah, thank you, David. That's definitely a gap that I've heard by having good conversations with uh, people in the sector, also participating in different chambers of commerce uh, Zooms, um, and uh, that's why we decided to address this issue. Uh, so uh, for businesses that don't have access to the wage subsidy or don't have access to the SIBA account, the $40,000 loan, well, they'll have any, another tool in their toolbox, another door to knock on, and it will be the regional development agencies. So if you're in Atlantic Canada, starting tomorrow, you'll be having access to uh, ACOA, Funding. If you're in Quebec, if you're in Quebec and you fall between the cracks, you can certainly go to DEC, Development Economic uh, Canada for the region of Quebec. If you're in Southern Ontario, uh, well, when I say Southern Ontario, it includes Eastern Ontario and it includes Western Ontario. Basically, it's everything outside Northern Ontario. It's FedDev. Uh, if it's Northern Ontario, it's FedNor. If you're in the West, it's Western Economic Development, which we call sometimes WD. And in the Great North, in the three territories, it will be Can North. So that would be my answer to that question, David. I would add to that, the issue of sole proprietorship is something that we're definitely looking at. And my colleague, Mary Ying and I are looking at different solutions. This is not only impacting the tourism sector, it is impacting in general, a lot of the retailers. And so we're trying to find a solution uh, to deal with that very issue. Uh, so please stay tuned. But meanwhile, if it's not a sole proprietorship issue, please go to your regional development agency uh, and definitely will be there uh, to, to help. And I would love to gather more feedback from all of you uh, while you're trying to, to uh, get access, have access to funding uh, through the regional development agencies. Okay, so that's uh, going to be an interesting and a positive development to minister. Yep. I'm sure that you can, for, for folks who want to contact regional development agencies, there's information on how to reach them through the ISED website, uh, but tomorrow we'll also post uh, key contact information for each of the regional development agencies on the Destination Canada website. Um, Minister, the next question is on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, um, and it's quite detailed. Will the government extend the CERB program for tourism workers who will be the last to return to jobs? And, uh, and I'll add a question uh, also about the same program. Uh, many owners who are only eligible for the CRB plus $1,000 a month, which is not sufficient to keep their businesses afloat and make ends meet personally. Will the government uh, lift the cap on the revenue made while collecting the CERB? We've increased the, we've made sure that the CRB was as broad as possible. Basically, folks, we didn't have time to create a new program. So we took the EI program and we expanded its definition. We've included self-employed people, people that didn't have access to, um, you know, EI because of the numbers of hours that they had accumulated was not enough. Uh, people that were staying at home because their children were at home because school is out. People that were sick or people that were taking care of sick, uh, sick, uh, sick loved ones. And so... You know, we've done that because we know that people are in a dire situation and we want to make sure that we're expanding the social safety net and that we're tightening it, that people are not falling through the cracks. 
this is our model in Canada. We believe that no one should left behind. And so if the pandemic is continuing and if the economic crisis is still hitting hard, we will be there. And that's what we've shown. We've shown flexibility, we've shown empathy, and we've shown that we can show very strong economic solidarity in these dire times. So that would be my answer regarding the CRB. Now, the CRB is not the only way the government is helping people in, in particular. We're doing that through the fact that we're helping families through the Canada Child Benefit people in general through the GST uh, funding. So if you receive a check from the mail and you're on, from the government of Canada and you're wondering what it is, it is the, the GST credit that we're sending you. Um, and also we've announced today for some of you that may be taking care of, of elderly people and, and elderly loved ones, we've, in, we've increased the, um, uh, the support for uh, for uh, seniors. And so um, that's why we will be there for every generation. Uh, we've supported students as well, as you may know. And uh, we are, uh, we definitely know that the tourism sector uh, is, is hard hit. And that's why this is the social safety net we're providing. Meanwhile, what I would like to make sure is that businesses in the sector also have access to the economic social safety net that we've developed, which are the different measures I've mentioned, which also includes the new one through the regional development agencies that I really hope will be Ha will be uh, having a positive impact in the tourism sector because I hold two hats. I hold the economy development agency ha uh, hat. So I'm in charge of these regional development agencies and the tourism hat. And so combining both is useful because I was able to make sure that we can prioritize tourism in the context of, of this new funding. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the question. And I appreciate uh, sort of the broad uh... Um, uh, and a large number of supports uh, that you've just outlined for everyone going beyond business specific supports. Um, the next question is for, um, um, will be for Charlotte to pose. All right, thank you, merci. Merci, um, Bonjour, Madame la Ministre. Hello, Charlotte. Hello. La prochaine question, est-ce que la subvention salariale de du Canada va être prolongée jusqu'au mois d'octobre? Mais je te dirais, Charlotte, que c'est un peu la même réponse que je viens de donner pour la PCU euh, pour, nos, euh, pour la subvention salariale. Donc, on sait que présentement, au, au moment où on a annoncé l'initiative, la subvention salariale était pour le mois de mars, avril et mai. Euh, et là, on a rajouté pour le mois de juin. Et si on doit continuer parce qu'on a trop d'entreprises qui, en, qui souffrent, que... Il y a encore beaucoup de confinement et que les entreprises ont besoin d'avoir accès à la subvention salariale, on va continuer. Parce qu'on se rappellera que la subvention salariale, elle est pour des entreprises qui ont 30 de pertes, ce qui est énorme. Et peut-être que peu à peu, il va y avoir des entreprises au fur et à mesure où il y a un déconfinement qui n'auront pas 30 de pertes, donc ils n'auront pas besoin de la subvention salariale. Mais peut-être qu'ils vont en avoir, qu'ils vont avoir besoin de cette subvention salariale-là parce qu'ils ont 30 de pertes, parce qu'ils sont dans notre secteur qui est extraordinaire, qui est le secteur touristique, et qui, malgré le fait qu'ils ont 30 de pertes, ils vont continuer d'opérer. Et donc, l'objectif, c'est qu'on soit là pour eux. Maintenant, travaillons ensemble pour euh, faire le suivi. Euh, moi, je pense qu'il y a énormément d'ouverture de la part du gouvernement quant à ces dispositions-là. Et puis, euh, je rappellerai aussi que les premiers transferts bancaires, les premiers chèques envoyés aux employeurs, euh, ont lieu la semaine passée. Donc, la, la, la subvention salariale vient d'être mise en vigueur. Ça faisait un mois et demi, deux mois qu'on en parlait, mais finalement, euh, les employeurs commencent à recevoir l'argent. Donc, ça, ça va aider énormément euh, les liquidités, puis en anglais, je dirais les cash flows de nos entreprises. Donc, pour tous ceux et celles qui nous écoutent, je vous invite à, à contacter l'Agence canadienne du revenu euh, pour être capable de voir à quel point vous êtes en mesure de postuler pour avoir accès non seulement présentement pour le mois de juin, mais aussi peut-être pour le mois de mars et avril euh, pour justement être capable euh, de, de pouvoir vous aider dans vos opérations. Merci, Madame la ministre. C'est vraiment une mesure qui est super importante. 
Et, euh, et comme vous le savez, là, les, les entreprises saisonnières n'ont pas eu accès parce que euh, leurs entreprises n'ont pas encore démarré euh, pour la saison. Alors, on, on a hâte de voir si ça va être étendu un petit peu plus loin. Mais euh, merci pour la réponse. Thank you. Um, thank you, Charlotte, and uh, thank you, Minister. The next question is on the subject of rent relief. Uh, uh, under the terms of the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance uh, Program, um, the question is, what are, what are my options uh, when my landlord does not wish to participate in the CECRA uh, and extend the benefit to me as a tenant because they do not want to contribute towards 25% of the gross rent minimum, if I'm understanding that correctly? Well, I, I'm always frustrated when I hear these, uh, these cases because it is frustrating. The rent relief uh, is for businesses that have lost 70% of their revenues. So the idea is they have 30% at least of losses, so they have access to the wage subsidy, and then they have 70% of losses, so therefore they have also access to the rent relief. So the landlord puts itself even in a position of whether he will continue to have a lessee. And in these circumstances right now, I think this is a bad dis business decision because it's not as if people will run to get new, you know, to, to, to get new, uh, new spaces. We are going through an economic crisis. So losing a lessee is losing a revenue. So there's a clear incentive to make sure that businesses, uh, that landlords uh, use this program. 50% of their rent is being paid by the government. 25% is being paid by the uh, business. And, and then they just have to assume 25%. Now, of course, it would be better if we would go ahead and, uh, you know, make it even stronger in terms of consequences. The federal government doesn't have that power. And that's frustrating, let's be frank, uh, because it is, we don't even have data regarding who is a landlord and who is a lessee. We don't know who are the lessees across the country, provinces know. Uh, we know who has a mortgage. And so what we can do is use the CMHC Uh, the Canadian Mortgage, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, association of, that that provides guarantees to our mortgages. 97% of businesses of real estate in Canada is mortgage right now. Uh, why? Because interest are low, uh, and since interests are low, well, it's a great way to get financing is through mortgages. We're looking for to see what we can do for. Uh, landlords that don't have mortgages, that would be the 3% of cases. We're working on that. But I've had a conversation with all the ministers of tourism and many of the ministers of economic development across the countries in provinces and um, to, to, to make sure that they would try to find ways to do from moral prostration to make it compulsory. Uh, and I know that provinces are looking at different options. But uh, I, I feel you, I understand the frustration, and I know this is at the core of your very survival. Uh, and let's make sure that we can work together to, to, to uh, make it as, as uh, interesting as possible for landlords to do it, but also interesting as possible for provinces to make it even stronger. Thank you, Minister, for taking that question on. Um, now we're going to turn to a slightly different uh, piece or aspect of the visitor economy, those important agricultural fairs and exhibitions that are very much part of the landscape in Canada, particularly in the fall. And the question is, what is being done for rural tourism? In particular, agricultural societies who host fairs and exp expositions that operate as nonprofits. These organizations provide a significant benefit to the surrounding community's economic uh, well-being and impact. Thank you. So that's a very good question. And uh, you will remember, David, and Charlotte will remember, and Ben will remember, that rural tourism was at the core of our national strategy uh, because we wanted to make sure that communities out there, uh, particularly rural communities, would benefit from uh, the positive impacts of, of tourism uh, for, for their own people uh, and also uh, for their entire region. So uh, bearing that in mind, 
uh, and the nearly $1 billion more to regional development agencies, we will wor be working with the community futures organizations. So the community futures organizations in Atlantic Canada, uh, folks call it much the CFDCs. Au Québec, les, quand on parle quand, en anglais, je dis les community futures organizations. Au Québec, on, on, on appelle ça les SADC. Euh, et, et partout à travers la francophonie canadienne, on appelle ça les, les sociétés d'appui de, de, euh, aux communautés rurales. Donc, il y a différents termes, mais essentiellement, euh, c'est des organisations qui sont là dans nos régions euh, rurales. And so, and then in the rest, in Ontario and in, in the, uh, across the West and the North, they call it community futures organizations in general. So, funding will be given to these organizations and they will then use that money to provide interest-free loans or small grants uh, to organizations that are key to the vitality of their community. Maybe the agricultural fair, like you were referring to David, or to the local restaurant, even the local gas station. Uh, sometimes when you live in a rural place, the next credit union branch or the next bank branch is a hundred kilometers away from your business or from your house. But the community futures organizations are usually there and they're well known, they're credible and they know the community and they can provide direct help. So that's why we've increased massively their budget. It's the first time they get such a big increase in their history. So they will be receiving more than $270 million to an administer to help businesses all across rural Canada. Thank you, Minister. Um, uh, again, another important component of the visitor economy and a business line here at Destination Canada is the subject of business events. And you heard uh, Ben at the outset talking about some of the losses that uh, business events um, suffered already in the country as a result of the pandemic. Um, some, a couple of specific questions for your consideration uh, in the business events category. With the enormous job losses in business and events industry, will the government consider stimulus options like tax breaks for meeting planners and meeting attendees or consider easing visa regulations for travelers coming to Canada to attend a business meeting or event? So I think we're still in the stabilization of the economy right now. And what we want is businesses that uh, are business owners that are listening to us and watching us right now can have access to the funding. All in terms of reopening the economy and restarting the economy, then eventually the relaunch of the economy, like uh, in terms of stimulus, definitely will get there. But this is not where we are right now. I think it's a three phase step, like the th three phase approach. The first one being stabilization, second restarting, third like uh, economic stimulus. Uh, but in terms of phase two and three, it will be a pleasure to have conversations with folks about that, hear all the great ideas. Right now, my preoccupation is if people don't have access to the SIBA account, if people don't have access to the wage subsidy, go see your regional development agency. If that's not working, I want to know. And, you know, we're there to make sure that businesses survive right now. And I'll advocate very strongly to make sure that the measures can apply in time also to the different uh, you know, tourism sectors all across the country. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for the invitation to let you know if uh, things are not working from the view of industry. Uh, I'm going to ask you a, a, a subject that's very sensitive, um, and, but um, I will ask it just because it's so important for the tourism industry in this country, and it's the question on reopening the borders. So the question specifically were businesses stand to lose a significant portion of their annual revenue if the border remains closed through the rest of May and June. When will the Canada, US and further international borders open and when will wel Americans be welcomed back in Canada? <laughs> it's a tough question. And it's a question that we need to reassess based on the health risks. And we will be taking that question based on our own uh, uh, capacity to deal with the health risks and also what are different neighbors well our neighbor to the south but also internationally what's going on 
uh, we are in close contact with not only the U.S. administration, but also with key governors. And uh, I've had good conversations with the mayor of Niagara Falls and the mayor of uh, Windsor and of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and I'm very much aware that in many places, um, it is, you know, these are border towns and, and this issue is particularly acute to them. Um, at the same time, um, I had a conversation with all the G20 ministers of tourism two weeks ago. And in that context, we all agreed. So the G20 ministers, uh, the G20 countries are the countries that uh, include obviously the G7, US, France, uh, the UK, Italy, uh, but also uh, China, also Singapore, uh, and, and, and also Brazil, uh, Mexico, places sometimes that even have a bigger part of their GDP that is tourism, uh, more than us. Uh, and we all agreed that our efforts would be first and foremost supporting local tourism within our countries, eventually, um, eventually uh, regional tourism, and then eventually national tourism, and then eventually international tourism. So this is, this is the reality that we're seeing in the G20. So it's not only Canada. And I know that there's a lot of anxiety towards the fact that the border is still closed, but at the same time, we need to make sure that not only do we assess the health risks, but that we have enough testing capacity and per personal protective equipment. That way, uh, workers in the tourism sector are protected, uh, business owners are protected, guests are protected. So it would be great, David, to work with Ben and Charlotte to find ways that we ensure that they're, you know, really trust in our tourism sector. Uh, as people will want to resume bit by bit their activities and discover a beautiful country. But let me tell you this, uh, we are working with Destination Canada to find ways to support local, regional uh, and national initiatives. Uh, you know that well. Um, and uh, we, this is for us uh, something that is paramount in terms of priority. Thank you and couldn't agree more, Minister. And um, uh, Charlotte's got the next question. All right. Thank you, Minister. Merci. Um, consumer protection laws and mandatory refunds is the next topic. C'est la question posée en français. Qu'allez-vous faire dans le dossier de l'Office de la protection des consommateurs qui demande au gouvernement fédéral que les entrepreneurs de l'industrie touristique et du voyage rembourse les clients au lieu de leur donner un crédit pour les services non rendus à cause de la COVID-19. En France et en Ontario, entre autres, les lois ont été changées dues à la COVID-19 et permettent aux entreprises de l'industrie touristique et du voyage de donner un crédit plutôt qu'un remboursement. Euh, je comprends que c'est un enjeu qui est clé pour... Euh pour, dans le fond, les revenus des, des entreprises dans le secteur. Euh, en même temps, ça me fait plaisir d'entendre un petit peu plus le point de vue des gens sur cette question-là, sachant aussi qu'il euh, va y avoir certainement de l'aide qui va être demandée de la part de nos compagnies aériennes, euh, alors que nos compagnies aériennes font face à des difficultés extrêmement criantes euh, et qui sont... Et, eux également en, en mode survie. Euh, en même temps, la question de la protection des droits des consommateurs relève davantage des provinces. Alors, euh, ça va être certainement une question qui va me faire plaisir de, de soulever à mes... De, que je vais pouvoir soulever auprès de mes collègues euh, parce qu'on euh, a un appel euh, conférence chaque semaine, tous les jeudis, euh, avec tous les ministres du tourisme au pays. Alors, euh, je, leur, euh, je leur passerai le message. Merci, Madame la ministre. C'est une question qu'on a soulevée plusieurs fois avec le ministère. Euh, c'est pas juste les lignes aériennes, en fait. Euh, puis on, on peut vous euh, communiquer plus d'informations, mais il y a un bon nombre euh, d'entreprises qui se retrouvent dans des situations précaires euh, suite à, à cette situation-là. Alors, c'est oui, les lignes aériennes, mais il y a aussi euh, un nombre énorme euh, d'entreprises à travers l'industrie qui, euh, qui font face à cette situation-là. Uh, over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. 
Um, the, the next question is concerns issues related to health and safety guidelines when things start opening up again. And uh, the question, Minister, is uh, um, uh, our industry cannot survive with restrictive social distancing rules for foreign travelers uh, or for any kind of group travel or meetings. Um, one, uh, one person who sent us a question said, how do you physically dis distance in a tour bus? So is the government thinking about taking a lead in developing national standards or guidelines for industry to manage issues like social distancing in the tourism context? Uh, well, I think uh, there's definitely an issue in terms of having access to personal protective uh, equipment. As we know, there's still a shortage in the country and we're still working with provinces to make sure that even frontline workers can have access to it. Um, and also we've provided guidelines in general to provinces and territory uh, to make sure that while they're thinking of restarting their economy that people on the ground have access to personal protective equipment and also testing. Folks, I would love to tell you that we found a vaccine and uh, that uh, things will be as they were, but we are not there. The vaccine has not been found and we're, we don't even have treatments for tr the treatment of symptoms of COVID-19. So we have to be careful. We have to make sure that we work together uh, because uh, we, we w it would be devastating uh, for the tourism sector if there would be outbreaks because of the fact that uh, we are not providing the, you know, basically the, the right um, uh, um, protection to guests. So I know there's been some initiatives uh, uh, by the hotel sector in other countries uh, that are trying to find ways uh, to, uh, to address this very issue. This is sometime, something that I've uh, asked my team to look into. So uh, I think it's a very good question and a, an issue that we should be looking at together. So uh, I'll come back to you with, uh, with how we can address this issue. And Charlotte, it would be a pleasure to work with the industry to find solutions also. Absolutely, and we're happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, a slightly different question, and uh, I wonder if you have a view on it. Uh, it concerns training uh, during uh, this time when people are at home. Uh, and the question reads, will the Government of Canada provide opportunities for Canadians in tourism to pursue some continued learning or courses or other professional development this year? Um, so I think, you know, while um, there are different ways, uh, definitely for students that were already um, studying, uh, they have access to uh, scholarships. So they have access to, um, um, so scholarships if uh, they do some volunteer work uh, and they have access to scholarships up to $5,000. So that's helpful. So if you have young, some of your young employees that you would love to train, well, I think that's a, a good way. Um, also, I know that some provinces have uh, have uh, done some good support also. Uh, I'm thinking of an initiative that is in Quebec uh, regarding training of staff. Uh, and it's a program called PACME. Uh, and I know that other provinces have also shown some leadership on that. Uh, but I think that using the wage subsidy can be a good way. Uh, meanwhile, if uh, you're able to, uh, to you know, use the program uh, to use this opportunity to train your staff. Thank you, Minister. Now, a bit of a, um, a break for you, Minister. Uh, the next question I have is actually for Tyax, so you get to uh, enjoy. <laughs> I'm I'm willing. I'm willing, David, to continue. So there there will be more questions, and I don't know. You may have a view on this question too, um, and uh, so. Uh, uh, for you, Charlotte, if you're ready. Uh, Charlotte, what are you doing to convince the federal government that tourism is one of the most important industry to Canada's economy after fossil fuels? And 
what are you doing to make sure the federal government does not ignore tourism during COVID-19's destruction of the tourism economy? Great question. Um, well, as, as you've heard during my remarks, uh, TIAC, of course, has been in daily contact with many government officials, including the minister and other cabinet ministers, as well as the Parliamentary Finance Committee on a regular basis throughout this crisis. And we've constantly been reminding officials of the importance of this sector as one of the country's most important economic drivers and job creators. But this isn't new. We've been advocating this for years and saying that tourism plays a critical role in Canada's economy and deserves more attention. And it's not just me. The minister who's on this call has said this time and time again. So I don't think that's a big um, shift in terms of opinion. Um, I think that's also why the government added tourism as a seventh strategic economic table in 2019 yeah. uh, in recognition of its contribution to the economy as Canada's largest service export and its unique role in supporting innovation and growth. Now we continue to emphasize this and um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, government has focused and, and the minister has explained that they have focused on relief measures for the broadest possible number of Canadians and businesses in the early part of the COVID crisis. Um, as we move into the recovery phase, our advocacy is going to continue to emphasize the importance of the sector and why priority should be given to those sectors that have been driving forces of the economy and those who have been the hardest hit. And certainly I think that tourism fits both of those criteria. And so we are there advocating on your behalf. We are advocating the importance of this sector. Every time we have a meeting with an MP, we walk into the room or we, at this point, email or send them a one pager that gives them the number of tourism jobs in the writing and tourism businesses as a reminder of why this is so important because tourism is in every riding across the country from coast to coast to coast. And it really is an important economic driver. And I think that is recognized. Um, that said, we have to continue to push on this and make sure that no one ever forgets that. So I wanna say thank you for asking that question and giving me an opportunity to respond to it. Thank you. And if I may, David, of course, sure. Minister. <laughs> Charlotte is doing an amazing work. Like, and uh, I must say that I've been the minister now for two years. So I've had the chance to be in charge of the tourism sector while it was going through its best year ever in his, its history. So what, which was 2019 with 22.1 million international visitors. And then I think the worst in decades. Um, <laughs> And I've seen both, and I've seen TIAC working tirelessly. Um, and I talk to my opposition critics and, and MPs, and we're all very much, and working together, quite frankly, the Conservatives, the NDP, the Bloc Québécois, because we know that it is extremely difficult right now for the tourism operators. And so TIAC is there trying to find ways I think, you know, with the, the, the good news we're coming up with tomorrow, this will, uh, you know, calm down some of the anxieties. But I think that um, the different restarting the economy is not happening everywhere in the same way. I was talking to my colleague, Jim McCuskey, who's the Minister of Tourism in Saskatchewan. Things are reopening in Saskatchewan. Well, that may not be the same way, for example, in, in downtown Montreal where COVID-19 is hitting hard and where I am right now. And so we need to be a, having a, 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 an approach that can be um, different. Uh, and that's why having measures that are very broad but that can apply definitely to tourism operators that need it is the right approach and we will be continuing to working with charlotte and her team thank you minister i appreciate that i know <laughs> i know the industry appreciates it you know it's 
this stuff keeps me up at night and I'm, I'm pretty sure it keeps you up at night also. Um, it does. Mm -hmm. It does because I know I've met you guys. I've seen you uh, in your businesses. I've seen you in Churchill or I've seen you in downtown Montreal and I know it's hurting. So I'm there yeah. for you. Thank you. No, we, we do appreciate that. And we appreciate you being here tonight um, with us. Now, I have the, the next question. And it's yep. for our friends at Destination Canada. So you get another break, Madame Nemi. <laughs> <laughs> Again, okay. <laughs> you can always jump in. Um, okay. As there are plans for Destination... Oh, sorry. Are there plans for Destination Canada to appeal to Canadians once again to travel domestically in late 2020 and 2021? Um, and Over to you, David. Thank you. And Charlotte, the short answer is yes. Um, I think people who know Destination Canada know that uh, the focus for quite a number of years has been on international marketing. Uh, and we have done some domestic marketing, usually around very specific themes, but it's not been um, our major focus. But we know that a domestic campaign is absolutely going to be a priority and we have a role to play in starting up uh, the visitor economy again when the time is right. So we've done a couple of things. Um, uh, uh, we've created inside Destination Canada, we've created a new domestic team, so a structural change. Uh, and we've really done a lot of work on developing research uh, that focuses on the domestic marketplace where previously we had a really good handle on what was happening internationally. We need to have the same high quality handle on what is happening domestically. And, you know, we've been using this time right now to fill that gap. We, we know there's some specific challenges we're going to have to address. And I think we heard a little bit about it tonight in comments from others. Uh, we're going to have to pay very close attention to public opinion. Uh, right now, Canadians are very concerned for their health uh, and why they, while they might be okay with uh, tourism starting up again in their local community, maybe their province, they're a little unsure about uh, welcoming visitors from other jurisdictions or even internationally. So I think we as an industry have a little bit of work to do to reassure Canadians uh, and remind them of the importance of the visitor economy in their own communities. Um, we also know uh, we have this great team Canada partnership with cities and provinces and one of our partners have been hit really, really badly uh, during this crisis and that's the cities uh, who usually are funded through hotel taxes that they're not getting. So whatever plan we come up with is really going to have to uh, focus on, you know, we need to start up local, hyper-local, and then sort of build out, as the minister said, you know, out to provincial, interprovincial, national, and then eventually international. But we really have to rely on um, the cities to help us get started. So we need a plan to address that, and we're working on it. And the other piece, uh, which uh, was, you know, that was just mentioned by the minister, is the fact that some parts of Canada are going to come out from this before other parts. And so any plan or program we put in place really has to focus very much on whatever the local conditions are, guided by provincial health authorities, which suggests to us that it'll be asymmetrical, that uh, we won't be able to roll out a program everywhere at once. We'll have to wait for conditions. So a long, complicated answer to say, yes, we were absolutely uh, thinking about it. I think there's great opportunity. Unfortunately, Canadians may not be able to travel internationally, um, and that's a large number of people, and we would encourage them to travel and stay at home, support their local businesses, and support Canadians, and I, I think we're going to develop a plan to do that. Back to you, Charlotte. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, David, and actually, uh, I just wanted to say I agree. Building consumer confidence is going to be key, and uh, I think the industry is definitely going to want to work with uh, with Destination Canada and rally together to make that happen. Um, the next question is for you again, um, David. As more and more newspapers go out of business and the travel sections of those who survived may well be eliminated, uh, I'm wondering if Destination Canada might take on a more proactive approach to publishing travel content from freelancers. Uh, yes, uh, you know, um, uh, particularly during this, uh, this time, earned media, which, uh, you know, uh, what we call it, and public relations 
uh, have always been an important part of the DC's campaign and it's definitely going to play a part and will be a component of the domestic campaign when we launch it. The best advice we can give now for travel writers is to continue working with the cities and provincial marketing organizations on pitching stories. Um, I also invite you to check out Arcanda for Glowing Hearts brand uh, and resources on our corporate website to gain an understanding on the types of stories and the orientation that we're looking for and the storytelling we want to do about Canada. So please take a close look at that. And um, as we bring this uh, webinar in for a closed minister, I'd invite you if you have any further thoughts or comments uh, that you'd like to share with us, uh, the platform is yours. Thank you, David. Thank you for your work. So I've, I've given good words, good remarks for Charlotte, and I wanted to do that for you too. Uh, I know that uh, Destination Canada is through, going through a lot of, uh, a lot of things right now and a, and a very, uh, uh, you know, important uh, transition. And I know that you're a good captain. So thank you for your work. It's very, and for your service is really, really appreciated. Um, folks, so um, my message to you is, uh, and, and, and David and Charlotte alluded to the question of consumer confidence. So when you look at the financial markets and even how business work, um, obviously we love certainty. Uh, we, we love, and I say we, it's because it be, before being in politics, I was in business. We know that uh, we can take good decisions decisions, business decisions, and based on a good risk assessment when we have access to more certainty. And financial markets uh, take into account direct inputs from demand and supply, inventories, and things like that. But when you look at it, two thirds of how financial markets work is based on consumer confidence and confidence in general. My message to you is, well, we know that the tourism is hard hit. We know also that we've gone through other crises and that we can face this one, survive and thrive. So let's work together to make sure that you have access to funding, you have access to uh, what you need to be able to survive these very difficult times as a government were your allies from Goody Hutchins uh, in Newfoundland up to Kate Young uh, in Southern Ontario in London, up to uh, uh, my colleagues and, and friends uh, in, in, uh, in BC. We are there to help you to hold your hand uh, while you're crossing the bridge. And let's make sure that we can all meet uh, on the other side of the shore. And that like we say in French, ça va bien aller. It will go bad. It will go better. So take good care uh, and keep up the great work. Uh, stay confident uh, and uh, let's continue these conferences. So David, Charlotte, it will be great if we could have another Zoom call like this in a couple of weeks to make sure that we can continue uh, the, this input of information uh, with our, our great industry. So merci beaucoup. Have a great day. Have a great evening. Merci, bonne soirée. Thank you so much, Minister. Oh, and thank you, Ben. That's all we have for, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, that's all we have for now. And I know the industry greatly appreciates hearing from you. And thank you, Charlotte, for participating on behalf of TIAC. We will continue to keep you up to date throughout this crisis. A recording of the webinar, as well as notes in both official languages will be available on our website soon. And we will have another webinar in about two weeks time as more information becomes available. Please do sign up for our newsletter and check the COVID-19 section of our website often for the most up-to-date information. I'd also like to take this opportunity to encourage you to keep in close contact with your local tourism authorities, including destination provincial marketing associations, and of course, the Tourism Industry Association of Canada. Finally, I'd like to once again thank Minister Jolie for taking the time to speak with us and for working with industry to make sure our concerns are heard. Thank you. Charlotte? Thank you. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Thank you, Destination Canada, for another great job putting this webinar together. Uh, so to the, the whole DC team, Dave, 
thank you for the great work you've done and Ben also for including me today. Um, again, to everyone, please continue to read our daily updates and consult our website. We're always updating information for you. Um, and we do want to hear from you. So please continue to do that. We need to hear your feedback. So it was, um, I think, a really good hour. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you. And thank you, Ben, also. I know uh, Ben has been tireless in terms of its work.